I guess we could uh, get started. Uh, I think more people uh, will be joining uh, later. Okay, but you know, let's uh, get started anyway. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome and welcome back uh, to the webinar series hosted by the Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai. Uh, my name is Selena Hong, Assistant Professor of Literature and the Interim Director of the Center acting on behalf of Tansen Sen today, the director who will uh, join us uh, a little bit later during the Q&A for the second half of today's webinar conversation. Uh, before we begin today's event, uh, I'd like to quickly give everyone a sneak peek of what's coming up on our events calendar. So if you look at uh, the slide uh, right here uh, in purple color, uh, as you can see, we have a very exciting month uh, in April. Uh, William Callahan will first speak with us about China's discourse of national humiliation in the 2020s. Uh, then in mid-April, uh, Professor Luo Liang will tell us about the transnational story uh, of the making of the Chinese national anthem. Then also uh, in mid-April, uh, we will have uh, Professor Anseng Ho uh, to join us at our Young Scholars Symposium as our keynote speaker. At uh, April's end, uh, Rebecca Ehrenworth uh, from Germany will walk us through the recent developments of Sino Thai literature. And lastly, uh, you can see that in, in early May, uh, Professor Josh Stenberg at the University of Sydney will talk with us about the transnational circulation of Chinese drama and theater. So uh, we have a, a list of you know, ex very exciting talks coming up. So please stay tuned for updates. Now, today, uh, we're very excited to host a Henry Luce Foundation funded lecture on the Indian Ocean with Professor Edward Alpers being our speaker. Now, uh, as you can see you know, from our videos, uh, also with us are three scholars working within the field or near the field. Uh, Professor Burkhard Schnepel, our current doctoral fellow, Alice Lin, and of course, our very own Tansen Sen joining us later. So together, uh, they will be uh, uh, this event's uh, interlocutors, co-moderators, and discussants during the Q&A session after Professor Edward Alperson gives his talk. Now, during the second part of the conversation, everyone in the audience, okay, let me just uh, you know, remind you, please feel free to also jump in and ask questions. And there are two ways uh, in which you can do that to uh, join the conversation. You can do so first of all, you know, by using the raise hand function in your own control panel uh, in the Zoom. Or uh, if you like, you can also write down uh, your question uh, in the chat box. Uh, Tansen and Alice you know, will uh, probably you know, either read or, or paraphrase your questions or synthesize a couple of similar questions for you. Uh, or uh, if you raise your hand, you know, we might ask you to unmute and uh, speak up directly to interact you know, with our speaker you know, and our uh, fellow interlocutors. So let me first quickly introduce Burkhardt and Alice. Uh, Burkhardt Schnebel is professor of social anthropology um, at the Institute of Social Anthropology and the director of the Center of Interdisciplinary Area Studies, both you know, at the Martin Luther University, Halle Wittenberg, Germany. Since 2013, uh, he is also head of the Max Planck Fellow Group entitled Connectivity in Motion, Port Cities of the Indian Ocean. His main theoretical and thematic interests are political rituals in India, especially in Orissa, or, and the history of the Indian Ocean world, especially Mauritius. Uh, now, Burkhardt has published uh, widely, and I would just uh, mention that you know, more recently in 2017, uh, he and Professor Alpers has co-edited the volume titled Connectivity in Motion, Island Hubs in the Indian Ocean World. So that's you know, very much connected to uh, the topic of today. Uh, here with us okay, is also Alice Lin, currently our doctoral fellow at the center uh, and a social cultural anthropologist working on commodity chains, artisanship and labor, environmental colonialism and knowledge production and China-Pakistan relations. Alice is now completing her dissertation titled Precious Economies, Gems and Value Making from the Afghan-Pakistan Borderlands at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And now let me uh, turn the floor uh, over to Burkhardt, who will formally introduce our speaker, Professor Edward Albers. So, on to you, Burkhardt. Yes, 
Thank you, Selina. Uh, hello, everyone. For some of us, it's good morning. For others, it's good afternoon. For some, it's good evening. But uh, I have the honor to introduce this event with a short glimpse at the work and life of our speaker today, Professor Edward Alpers, who currently is research professor emeritus in the Department of History at the University of California in Los Angeles. When I looked at the list of members of the audience that have registered for the event, I realized that there are many senior colleagues and many of them know Ned Alper's work and probably him personally very well, but there will also be many younger scholars who like to get an idea about who is speaking. So let me start. Professor Alpers has a long and distinguished academic career in different places in the world. He studied African history at Harvard and received his PhD from SOAS University. Interest, namely the history of East Africa, also and especially 19th century Mozambique. Thematically, he is an expert in the political economy and international trade in this region and time, though he always was concerned to include a cultural dimension of economic changes. One of his major publications to exemplify this combined field of interest is his Ivory and Slaves in East Central Africa, published in 1975. He has a vast number of publications on this region and on this theme of slavery or bonded labor, as well as on various other themes, too many to mention them all here. But looking at his list of publications, what impresses also apart from the sheer quantity and as many of us know, the highest quality of this, these publications is the large number of books which Professor Alpers has published and edited, not just by himself, but together with colleagues. This is an excellent indicator for the fact that Ned, as he's known to his friends and colleagues, is a great team player and very much involved in the networks and organizations of his trade. Among others, he also was the president of the African Studies Association in the mid 90s, 1990s, let me mention some of these uh, publications. Uh, maybe I skip it because it's getting too long. But what is especially important for the topic of this presentation today, and supposedly for many people in the audience, is the fact that Edward Alpers very early developed a sense for the maritime dimension of East African history. Ned was part of and instrumental in establishing and promoting for some time now what is known as Indian Ocean Studies. In this context, I like to point out that in 2007, he co-edited with Simanchu Prabhavi a volume entitled Cross Current and Community Networks, subtitled The History of the Indian World, Ocean World. In 2009, appeared a collection of essays under the title East Africa and the Indian Ocean. And last but not least, in 2014, he published a very readable and thought-provoking general introduction into the history of the Indian Ocean world with Oxford University Press, which, by the way, is compulsory reading for my own students in Germany. Let me also add that Professor Alpes, at present, is collaborating with Thomas McDowell, working on a primer for teaching Indian Ocean world history, which will appear at Duke University Press in due time. At around 2016, Ned Alpers and, started, and I started to get to know each other. I was intrigued by an article of his in which he deplored that Indian Ocean islands, the island factor as he called it, were very much neglected in research. While I was about to prepare a conference on the islands of the Indian Ocean in Halle at the Max Planck Institute, I contacted Ned and he readily agreed to participate and inspire the conference with his presence. And even more so, he joined me as a co-editor 
when it came to make a publication out of this contribution to this event. Selina has already mentioned it. It was during that process of editing that I came to cherish how collegial and professional at the same time, how serious and yet full of humor, again at the same time, Professor Alpes is pursuing his job, not only when it comes to his own publication, but also when it comes to work on the publications of colleagues, especially younger scholars. In this context, it should be mentioned in passing that he served as a chair and examiner for more than 70 PhD dissertations. I'm sure more will come. If you want to write your dissertation, just give Ned a phone call, he will be there. Ned has been much too active and productive as to be able to mention the most important activities of his within the five minutes, which the Shanghai organizers allowed me to introduce him. Many of you know him much better than this, and those who do not will at least have got an idea that Professor Alpers, Ned is not just an eminent scholar, but a pleasant colleague and a very fine person as well. Now, let us look forward to what he has to say about the past, present, and future of Indian studies. And with this, I hand over to you, Ned. Thank you very much. I, I feel as though I should just go back to bed now instead <laughs> after that introduction. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, uh, Selena and Alice and Burkhart and Thompson for inviting me. Um, I, I mentioned before we came on air that the first time I, uh, let me get my screen up here. That the first time uh, I encountered Thompson was actually at in the book exhibit uh, at uh, the only uh, AAS meeting that I uh, participated in. Uh, and at that time I bought his first book uh, that had just been published by the University of Hawaii Press. So there's a nice kind of connection from that time uh, some years ago until, until today. So the, this, this morning for me, it's uh, just past six o'clock in the morning, uh, I'm gonna talk about Indian Ocean Studies. How did we get here and where are we going? <clears throat> as recently as 2006, Karen Wigan, the coordinator of a major American Historical Review Forum that featured Oceans of History, observed enthusiastically, quote, maritime scholarship seems to have burst its bounds. Across the discipline, the sea is swinging into view. She noted further that, quote, this AHR forum looks at one branch of this burgeoning scholarship, namely studies that adopt a single more or less bounded body of water as their focus or frame. The forum featured stimulating essays on the Mediterranean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean by leading scholars. Yet as Professor Wigan lamented in a footnote, quote, Regrettably, the equally rich historiography of the Indian Ocean is not covered in this forum. Surely this was a lost opportunity, one that the AHR has not by and large bothered to rectify over the past 15 years. Today, I propose to offer a survey that seeks first, to locate the broader scholarly literature across numerous disciplines in the humanities and social sciences on the Indian Ocean world in an historical context. Second, offers some perspective on how certain key ideas have emerged. And third, looks hopefully to the future of Indian Ocean Studies. Where to begin? The earliest attempt to deal historically in a serious, if popular, account was penned not by an historian, but by a renowned world sailor, Alan Villiers, author of the well-known account of his travels from Kuwait um, to the Swahili coast aboard the Kuwaiti boom Triumph of Righteousness in 1938. Although Villiers' Monsoon Seas, the story of the Indian Ocean, is largely forgotten by mo modern scholars, it is actually well-researched and informed by his own extensive experience of seeing things from the sea, thus giving him a quite different perspective than most sedentary scholars. In many respects then, Villiers embodied the kind of interdisciplinary approach to Indian Ocean Studies that we in the Academy today advocate. If pushed to name a pioneering study 
of Indian Ocean history, however, most contemporary historians would identify a volume by the prolific archivist in chief of Mauritius, Auguste Toussaint, whose understandable island-centric approach was published in French in 1961 and translated into English in 1966. Nevertheless, the Indian Ocean had not yet achieved the kind of wider recognition as a legitimate field of scholarship that it presently enjoys. Moreover, although certain scholars did recognize the significance of the Indian Ocean, they did so not as an object of study in itself, but within the context of some other historical unit of study. Indeed, the Indian Ocean was not entirely ignored by a handful of imperial historians such as Holden Ferber. Writing in the late 1940s about the English East India Company, Ferber broke new ground in imperial historiography by emphasizing the importance of the Asian dominated country trade as underlying the company's commercial success. In so doing, he revealed himself to be an important observer of Indian Ocean trade in the late 18th century. By any measure, however, <clears throat> the leading proponent of an Indian Ocean based historiography in the 1950s and 1960s was Charles R. Boxer, who happened also to be one of my PhD thesis examiners in 1966 at the University of London. Boxer was an exceptionally prolific scholar whose work spanned both the Atlantic and Indian Ocean worlds. Although the focus of Bo Boxer's scholarship was on European expansion, Boxer was always alive, alert to the hazards of seafaring and the significance of naval power in his scholarship. Also noteworthy during this period was Gerald Graham's study of Great Britain in the Indian Ocean during the first half of the, of the 19th century, which specifically highlighted maritime enterprise in the subtitle. Two other significant scholarly contributions to Indian Ocean historiography in the 1970s were by Jean Aubin and Neil Steensgaard, both focused on the post-1500 period of European maritime intrusion. Oban's scholarship focused on the meticulous analysis of both Portuguese and Indian Ocean language sources, mainly Arabic and Persian, for the 16th century. Steensgaard's major contribution was his thesis that there was a fundamental economic and institutional break in 1600 that marked the demise of the so-called peddler trade that characterized Indian Ocean trade of both pre-1500 and the 16th century Portuguese Estrada de India as both the English and Dutch merchant companies surpassed the older commercial regime. What stands out, of course, is that all of this post-World War II Indian Ocean historiography is ultimately about European expansion, rather than the Indian Ocean world on its own terms. For a distinct field of Indian Ocean studies to emerge in its own right depended on a coming together of several larger factors, among them, the refiguring of historical scholarship in a post-colonial world and the con consequent development of world history as a field of inquiry and instruction. From the mid 1970s, three important publications occurred that marked a new beginning in Indian Ocean studies. First was the appearance of a collection of papers presented at a 1967 Nairobi conference on East Africa and the Orient. While the focus was on Africa, the scope of papers presented ranged across the Indian Ocean and included chapters on both Arabic and Chinese sources for East African history. This volume was followed by the proceedings of the initial meeting of the International Conference on Indian Ocean Studies, ICIOS as it was known, which was organized in August 1979 by Frank Rosa and Kenneth McPherson and convened at Perth, Western Australia, where both taught. During this period, Perth offered a unique venue, both because of its outward orientation to the Indian Ocean and insular Southeast Asia, as well as a viable meeting place when South Africa was still under apartheid rule and other Indian Ocean nations were mainly preoccupied with internal affairs. Conference proceedings were published in six volumes that covered environment and resources, trade and development, the history of commercial exchange and maritime transport, international politics, cultural exchanges and influences, and archives and resources for study. A year later, in 1980, 
UNESCO published the report and papers of a critical seminar on the Indian Ocean that it had organized at Port Louis, Mauritius in July 1974 as part of a planning process for its general history of Africa. According to the anonymous introduction to this pioneering collection, quote, the twofold purpose of the meeting was first to take stock of the present state of knowledge and secondly, to coordinate several existing programs and possibly to put forward proposals for a new pluricontinental and intercultural program among the various research specialists and institutions concerned. It is worth noting, however, that even in a meeting devoted to the Indian Ocean, the term pluricontinental reminds us that the focus remained landbound rather than on the sea. Individual contributions included chapters that indicated the connections between different continental subregions of the Indian Ocean world as they affected Eastern Africa. Of particular interest is the chapter by James Devere Allen, quote, a proposal for Indian Ocean studies in which he notes the importance of delineating, quote, a definition of the Indian Ocean as a study area. Allen was born in Kenya to Australian parents and spent the early years of his academic career in Kuala Lumpur before returning to East Africa and immersed himself in Swahili culture, giving him an Indian Ocean perspective that had eluded most previous scholars. In his brief chapter, Allen suggests three layers of unity. These included first, quote, racial unity of a sort provided by Malay and other migrations. Secondly, cultural unity radiating out from the Indian subcontinent. And thirdly, the religious unity provided by Islam, end quote. However problematic we may regard Allen's suggested layers, they nevertheless reveal an initial attempt to grapple with the challenge of conceptualizing the Indian Ocean world and Indian Ocean studies. Equally, the ambitious, if not always realized, recommendations of the UNESCO experts show the way towards the proliferation of Indian Ocean Studies scholarship that has developed since 1980. A second conference on Indian Ocean Studies, ICIAS II, again took place in Perth five years later, establishing Western Australia as the leading Indian Ocean Center for the study of the wider region. Like its multidisciplinary pre predecessor, papers presented at ICIAS II were collected in multiple photocopied volumes, in this case numbering seven. By this time, it is clear that groundwork for a much more vigorous and self-conscious historiography was now emerging. Here the lead was taken by Indian economic historian Kirti Chowdhury. Chowdhury was inspired by Fernand Brodel's hugely influential History of the Mediterranean Sea, and in 1985 published his major contribution, Trade and Civilization in the Indian Ocean. Powerfully conceived and meticulously presented, Chowdhury's work was nevertheless limited both by its periodization and by his relative negligence of Africa, a prejudice that he explicitly articulates in his much larger follow-up Indian Ocean volume five years later. Chowdhury's pioneering volume was followed in the 1990s by single volume histories of the Indian Ocean by Patricia Rizzo and Ken McPherson. Trained as a Middle Eastern historian of the Gulf, Rizzo's approach mirrors Chowdhury's but extends into the 19th century. Unlike both Chowdhury and Rizzo's interventions, however, McPherson adopts a long durée approach to the region's history, encompassing both its vast extent and its exceptional historical depth. As one of the ICIAS driving forces, it is no surprise that McPherson sought to write a more comprehensive history of the Indian Ocean. In his preface to his book, he writes that it, quote, evolved out of 15 years of teaching undergraduate courses in South Asian and Indian Ocean history. And that, quote, the teaching of Indian Ocean history provided many challenges in establishing the concept of the region and presenting it to fellow Australians as part of their world, end quote. Also in the early 1990s, novelist Amitav Ghosh wove together materials from the Geniza trove of medieval Jewish documents with his own anthropological research on modern Egypt to create a stimulating imagination of an Indian Ocean world that is both rooted in and stands outside historical time. His In an Antique Land 
remains a standard reading assignment for undergraduate courses in Indian Ocean history, raising challenging questions about worldview and methodology. In 2003, Mike Pearson published a landmark book that became the standard introduction to Indian Ocean history. Pearson says in his introduction, quote, I want to write a more total history that has, than has appeared so far. His volume has many virtues, most notably his emphasis on the ocean itself and extensive quotes from travelers on its waters. But as he himself has noted, it largely ignores the Malay world. Abdul Sharif's Dal Cultures of the Indian Ocean draws upon a lifetime of scholarship on Zanzibar and the Swahili coast and focuses attention on the Western Indian Ocean in the period before Portuguese intrusion of Vasco da Gama. His thick historical description goes well beyond Chowdhury's more limited economic approach. Without question, the most monumental of these contributions is the two volume history of the pre-1500 Indian Ocean world by French agronomist, ethnographer, linguist, and historian Philippe Beaujard. Totally more than 1,400 pages of text, illustrations, notes, and sources, Beaujard's tome ranges across the entire geography of the Indian Ocean world from the fourth millennium BCE to the 15th century CE. His approach is inspired by world systems analysis that regards the Indian Ocean as its own world economy long before the rise of capitalism. Originally published in French in 2012, both volumes have since been revised and translated by Philippe, it should be noted, into English. Richly detailed and about as comprehensive as one could wish, they stand as major reference works, whether or not one subscribes to world systems analysis. Chugata's Bose's sh short, incisive study of the Indian Ocean world in the modern era embraces an Indian perspective on the wider region. Like Bojar, Bose advocates a comprehensive vision of, of a global world that rejects its subordination to external forces, although his book is only marginally about the Indian Ocean world. In 2014, I published my own attempt to capture the entirety of the Indian Ocean's historical experience from its ancient past to the present in the context of world history. Most recently, Gwyn Campbell published an innovative long durée history of, the Indi of Indian Ocean Africa that emphasizes the interaction between environmental factors and human agency, while also suggesting an alternative chronology to most received Indian Ocean histories. No doubt, other variations on these contributions will be published by individual historians in years to come. Meanwhile, the past two decades have witnessed a virtual explosion of scholarly articles, collections of essays, and single author monographs on different aspects of Indian Ocean history. What I think this phenomenon represents is the wider academic acceptance of world history as a historiographical field and the entrance of a new generation of scholars from both within and without the Indian Ocean world. Greater scholarly interest in global comparative slavery and commodities were arguably also at for forces at work in driving this explosion. Some focus on a particular subregion of the Indian Ocean world, some on a single commodity of regional trade, some on cultural exchange, some on religion, especially Islam, but also Buddhism. Most do so within a restricted time frame. One important area for understanding the deep history of the Indian Ocean is archaeology. In general, most archaeological research is published in scientific journals and field reports, but there are a handful of important archaeological studies that have been published as books. Pioneering work dating back into the 1990s on seafaring and maritime history in ancient South Asian waters has been done by Himanshu Prabha Ray. Stephen Sidebotham has produced an accessible presentation of the rich findings at the Roman Egyptian port of Berenike, which involved an international team of archeologists. More typical of books on the ancient period are edited volumes that incorporate the voices of many of the individual scholars who worked on a site. Three of special significance for the Indian Ocean 
cover excavations at the Red Sea port of Ajulis, the Horn of Africa island of Socotra, and the ancient Sri Lankan port of Montide. Especially intriguing for its connections to the Swahili coast is the report of excavations by a team of French archaeologists at the medieval site of Sharma, Yemen. For the medieval period, we are fortunate to have a number of truly outstanding works. Both Roxani Margarita's careful study of 13th and 14th century Aden and Elizabeth Lamborn's Abraham's Luggage, an extraordinary dissection of a single 12th century document to unpack the material culture of a Jewish merchant linking Egypt, Aden, and Malabar, are impressively interdisciplinary and methodologically sophisticated. Both also demonstrate the evidentiary riches of the Geniza documentation that bears upon the so-called India trade of medieval Cairo. Sebastian Pranga explores the link between merchants and the evolution of a specific Indian Ocean variety of what he calls monsoon Islam in Malabar from the 12th into the 16th century. The first volume of Andre Vink's meticulous study of the Indo-Islamic world is also firmly situated within the Western Indian Ocean. Regrettably, there is no exact parallel for the Eastern regions of the Indian Ocean world, but both Thompson Sen's study of Buddhism and India-China relations and Kenneth Hall's history of Southeast Asia to 1500 assign an important role to maritime trade. When we turn to the period after about 1500, we first encounter the scholarship of two pioneers. Published as a posthumous collection of his essays in 2001, the body of work on Indian Ocean merchants by distinguished Indian historian Ashim Dasgupta spans essays dating as far back as the mid 1950s to the beginning of the current millennium. Read together, they reveal a restlessly inquisitive mind that sought to understand the place of Indian merchants in the Indian Ocean world. His contributions serve as an important intellectual bridge between the scholarship of the second half of the 20th century and the present, as is apparent from the regular citation of his work by younger scholars. Equally influential have been essays by Mike Pearson, some of which have been republished in a single volume. Among the current generation of Indian Ocean scholars, first books by Eng Sang Ho, trained as an anthropologist, Nancy Um, trained as an art historian, and historians Jeremy Prestholt, Sebel Aslanian, Pedro Machado, Matthew Hopper, Hideaki Suzuki, Bahad Bishara, Thomas McDowell, and Christopher Lowe are among my favorites. Ho's striking study of migration, family ties, and Islamic practice connecting the Hadramaut and the Malay archipelago set a new standard for examining links between the Western and Eastern reaches of the Indian Ocean world. Nancy Um opens up an entirely novel perspective on Indian Ocean history by focusing on the interplay between trade and architecture at the Red Sea port of Mocha. As I noted on the back cover blurb for Prestholt's analysis of East African consumerism in the long 19th century, his book, quote, ingeniously stands the study of globalization and trade on its head. For while historians of my generation had focused on trade and production, Prestholt's work shifted the focus onto the essential role played by African agency and taste. Aslanian's research on the Indian Ocean commercial network of Armenian merchants from New Julfa, Iran, makes visible an extraordinary archive of primary source materials for regional history, but also the mechanisms of organizing trade within the Armenian community and the critical significance of trust in trade. Machado's analysis of commercial ties between Mozambique and Gujarat goes well beyond previous studies of how the organization of trade, production, financing in Western India, and parallel African consumer demand work together across the Western Indian Ocean. Matthew Hopper locates his analysis of slavery in the Arabian Gulf in the context of both the Western Indian Ocean and the rapidly developing globalization of the late 19th century as does Suzuki in his work on slave traders. For his part, Bishara, who studied with Ho at Duke University, opens up an entirely new frontier of legal history as it applies to the commercial history of the same region. 
His work also demonstrates the value of previously unexamined Arabic documentation for the modern history of the Indian Ocean. McDowell draws upon a parallel body of Arabic documentation while focusing on the role of debt linking both coastal and interior Oman and East Africa in the 19th century. Finally, Lowe demonstrates that the Indian presence at the heart of Islam rendered late Ottoman Mecca in many, quote, in many ways as much an Indian or Indian Ocean space as it was an Arab, Ottoman, or Middle Eastern one. These two decades have also seen important monographs by three historians who have previously worked on Arabia and South Asia. Anna Bang studies Sufi networks linking linking Arabia and Eastern Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. Her ability to trace family connections across the Western Indian Ocean and the role of island communities in this history are important scholarly interventions. Niall Green builds on his own earlier studies of Sufism in South Asia to reconstruct the emergence of a novel variety of urban Islam that developed in 19th century Bombay and expanded across the Western Indian Ocean to South Africa. Green's conceptualization of how modernity, Islam, and mobility across the Indian Ocean interact offers a most stimulating gateway for future research. Sunil Amrith combines environmental factors with the more familiar topic of labor migration in his notable analysis of the Bay of Bengal. Not least of his contributions in this book is that it offers a coherent vision of this critical sea within the wider Indian Ocean so often dominated by studies of the Western Indian Ocean. The Eastern frontier of the Indian Ocean world is also the focus of two remarkable books by Ronit Ricci. The first of these examines Islamic literature and conversion in South and Southeast Asia and introduces the important concept of an Arabic cosmopolis. Her latest book reverses this direction by looking at Malay diaspora and writing in Sri Lanka. Islamic pilgrimage across the Indian Ocean is the subject of Eric Taliakatsu's multifaceted text on the Hajj from Southeast Asia to Arabia. Kerry Ward expands our appreciation of imperial networks by linking Dutch Batavia to Sri Lanka and the Cape through an analysis of penal exile and Islamic networks. Beyond connections between Southeast Asia and the Western reaches of the Indian Ocean, there is also a long history of maritime relationships with South Asia, South China. Studies of the so-called Nanhai trade were pioneered by senior Chinese historian Wang Gungwu at the turn of the millennium. Over the past two decades, a series of edited volumes have perceived very, pursued various aspects of commerce and maritime history in the South China Sea including its links to the Indian Ocean world. One aspect of these studies is clearly the migration of Chinese merchants and laborers out into the Indian Ocean world. To what extent this renewed interest in the Indian Ocean among China scholars may mirror the geopolitical forces driving China's Belt and Road Initiative remains an intriguing hypothesis. The previously neglected Indian Ocean diaspora from Madagascar spanning the Southwest Indian Ocean is at the center of the late Pierre Larson's remarkable work on vernacular language and creolization that is based on a unique corpus of documents written in Malagasy. Larson's initiative clearly reflected his personal history of growing up in Madagascar and becoming a historian of slavery and the slave trade. From a wider perspective, UNESCO's Slave Root Project, launched in 1994, has encouraged the study of the global African diaspora and complemented the trend towards world history in academia. Turning to a different Indian Ocean diaspora, although there were many studies of India, Indians in Africa by both historians and social scientists, two studies by literary scholars of links between India and Africa emphasize the larger Indian Ocean context in exciting new ways. Gaurav Desai's wide-ranging analysis of a diverse body of Indian tra travel writing on East Africa demonstrates the great utility of adopting a history of literature perspective on this complicating hist complicated history. No less thought-provoking is Isabel Hoffmeyer's literary analysis of Gandhi's South African newspaper, Indian Opinion, 
which not only locates this enterprise in the larger Indian Ocean context, but also reveals Gandhi's ideas about how to convey information. Antoinette Burton brings her historian sensitivity to imaginative literature to illuminate Indian attitudes towards Africa and Africans. Not to be overlooked in any survey of Indian Ocean studies are seminal works on historic traditions of shipbuilding and sailing ships. As early as 1965, Dutch anthropologist A.H.J. Prince provided an astonishing wealth of observed detail on the maritime cultural culture of Lamu, Kenya. Maltese Arabist Dionysius Aegeus has published several exceptionally important monographs about Dows in the Gulf and the Red Sea, as well as another on classic Islamic shipping. Taken together, they comprise a remarkable body of work that is both technically and culturally astute. Although no exact parallels to Aegeus's output on Dows exists for other Indian Ocean ship traditions, French archaeologist Pierre-Yves Manguin has written a series of stimulating papers on traditional shipbuilding and ships in the Eastern Indian Ocean. In addition to these and many other five monographs that were published over the past two decades, several influential collections of essays have also appeared during this surge of interest in the Indian Ocean. Or in the Indian Ocean. Critical factors in this category of collective scholarship are the joining of forces by like-minded scholars and the widely acknowledged appreciation that studying the Indian Ocean is necessarily a collaborative effort that requires multiple disciplines, methodologies, and languages. Indeed, an important feature of many of these volumes of collected essays is that their contributors include historians, social scientists, and humanists broadly defined. Major conferences in New Delhi in 2003, Johannesburg 2007 and Zanzibar in 2008 have produced valuable general volumes in the 2000s. At the same time, collections on specific aspects of research or themes have generated much scholarly interest, as in the case of those focusing on China's maritime history noted above. One of the most influential and controversial collections emphasizes the cosmopolitan character of Indian Ocean Islam. Indicative of the rapidly changing scholarship in the Indian Ocean world is a volume that stands generations of land-based Indian historiography on its head by arguing for the influence of the Indian Ocean on the shaping of early modern India. This shift in perspective on Indian history has been a long time coming, but like the possible subtle influence of the Belt and Road Initiative on China scholars, might not the Indian response to Indian Ocean maritime leadership be at work here as well? Many of the conferences organized by Gwynne Campbell's Indian Ocean World Center at the IOWC at, Mac at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, have produced specific theme volumes that are published in an Indian Ocean series by Palgrave Macmillan. Some of these address familiar topics like trade and networks of connectivity, although often in innovative ways, as in the case of animal trade. Others raise novel themes such as medicine, islands, knowledge, and disease. Ohio University Press is home to a parallel Indian Ocean series that also includes both individual monographs, such as series, series editor Richard Allen's study of European slaving in the Indian Ocean, and two stimulating collections of essays. The first of these brings together historians and archaeologists to explore both methodological and historical linkages. The second examines one of the principal commodities of the Indian Ocean trade, pearls from a number of sites and perspectives. Finally, I want to mention an important collection of essays on slavery and slave trade in the Indian Ocean world, Traite et Esclavage en Afrique Orientale et dans l'Océan Indien, that, is, that because it is published in French may be overlooked in an overwhelmingly Anglophone Indian Ocean literature. Apart from its many individual case studies, this volume is graced by two outstanding overview chapters by one of its editors, Henri Médard. So now I go on to a different set of issues. Any historian who ventures to work in the Indian Ocean world must recognize at once that it is a multilingual space and that the sources for understanding its past are both scattered and in many cases still to be discovered. 
Indeed, for inhabitants of the historic Indian Ocean world, heteroglossia was arguably the norm rather than the exception. In addition to the many languages, ancient and modern, Asian, African, and European that might be consulted, other sources upon which the historian draws include archeology, span historical linguistics, ethnography, and genetics. These sources are by no means evenly distributed. For example, there is much, a much richer archeological record for the Swahili coast than for insular Southeast Asia. Imaginative literature and oral tradition may also be valuable sources depending on the time and place being studied. Thus far, I've dragged you through a presentation of what I consider to be a body of important works, mostly by historians on the Indian Ocean world. I now want to explore larger questions of definition and conceptualization as they might help to shape our future thinking. At the time of this writing, in fact, there is an upwelling of webinars and online conferences that are pushing the limits of Indian Ocean studies in most promising ways. There are also a number of new institutional initiatives devoted to Indian Ocean studies that are taking shape across the globe. But before I turn to these, let me say something about the various ways in which historians have sought to organize our thinking about the Indian Ocean world. Among first order concerns have been efforts to define the spatial dimensions of the Indian Ocean world, quite apart from the larger question of how, the Indian, how far the Indian Ocean extends. The most fertile of these imaginations, imaginations has been Pearson's notion of literal society, which he first proposed in 1985 and reconsidered in a characteristically thought-provoking way in 2006. Pearson argued that these seaward-looking societies shared more in common with each other than they did with the communities in their continental hinterlands, though his, although his later essay complicates this fundamental concept. Nevertheless, the idea of literal society has unquestionably taken hold among historians of the Indian Ocean world, myself included. Both Ken McPherson and Shugata Bose have suggested broad concept for understanding the Indian Ocean world that move away from notions of land-based civilizations that Chowdhury emphasized. McPherson preferred the idea of culture, what he called culture zones with boundaries that featured a porous frontier. Bose suggests the equally useful idea of the Indian Ocean world as a quote, an interregional arena for studying this vast world region. Jeremy Prestholt considers the Indian Ocean as a contemporary analytical space and provocatively suggests that quote, basin consciousness, as he calls it, has begun to reverse the introverted politics of the early post-colonial era and animate the Indian Ocean as an idea. pages on stuck. A different way to approach the Indian Ocean world is to think beyond the monsoon cycle to incorporate other environmental factors and their human interactions, as Campbell does in his History of Indian Ocean Africa. Sharif includes a valuable analysis of regional geographies in his book on Dao cultures, where he emphasizes the distinct yet complementary zones of the Swahili coast, what he calls, quote, the intermediate desert zone and the Western Indian Ocean seaboard, Western Indian seaboard. Periodization is another tried and true organizing principle that continues to organize, uh, to exercise historians. Whereas Pearson and I write about the deep history of the Indian Ocean world in, gen in our general texts, and Gwyn Campbell begins his study of early times in Indian Ocean Africa as far back as about 300 BCE, the undoubted champion of a detailed approach to the distant past of the Indian Ocean world is Philippe Beaujard. Still, few seek to cover the whole span of historical experience from such early eras into the current era. More immediate to many historians are the finer questions of periodization that help us to define critical historical transitions. Clearly, the rise of Islam and the coming of the Portuguese and their successors are widely understood to be traditional transitions, important transitions, but how best to define such amorphous and mutable terms as ancient and medieval or pre-modern and modern in an Indian Ocean context. 
Do such temporal categories speak to each other, facilitate, or hinder understanding? For example, Campbell argues vigorously against the notion of early modern in an Indian Ocean world context because of its subordination to European periodization categories. Or does it make better analytical sense to think of a long 18th century as Prasanon Parasarati and Giorgio Riello contend rather than a long 19th century as I have suggested? One of the most persistent tropes for thinking about the Indian Ocean world is cosmopolitanism, which has many academic adherents. To be sure, there are many cosmopolitan features across the Indian Ocean world, most notably as they pertain to urban areas. But as I have written elsewhere, I'm skeptical of applying cosmopolitanism as an all encompassing theory or even rubric to the entire region across all time and space. I prefer the less comprehensive more complicated notion of translocality advocated by geographer Julia Byrne and among others. Historian Niall Green advocates a complementary theoretical perspective in heterotopia by which he envisions the Indian Ocean as a quote, an arena of difference, perhaps challenging Bose's notion of the Indian Ocean world as an interregional arena. Green has also noted the continuing role value of, compar of a comparative perspective which is implicit in much writing, writing on the Indian Ocean world. Rather than comparison, Sanjay Subramanian's conceit of connected histories has become a powerful organizing principle for many historians in recent years. Still another theoretical model that has attracted much attention from Indian Ocean scholars is network theory. To what extent the strict applicability of this theory as opposed to a less rigid appreciation of the many different networks that crisscross the Indian Ocean world may appeal depends very much on the individual. What each of these competing ideas reveals beyond question is that the Indian Ocean has been and continues to be an historical space that evokes serious thought by those who seek to understand its past and present. Mobility and connectivity in many guises continue to dominate Indian Ocean studies. Whether conceived of under the rubric of trade, commodity history, diaspora, or sacred geography and pilgrimage, these themes remain constant features of Indian Ocean world historiography. The overwhelming majority of these studies, however, continue to be androcentric largely because the sources for Indian Ocean history emphasize the role of men in commerce and religion. Nevertheless, studies of both the African and Indian diasporas have not ignored a more gendered perspective that includes women. Holly and Wint's research on Gujarat merchant families in East Africa represents a pioneering venture in gendered history. Still, teasing out the history of women in the Indian Ocean world remains a challenge. What is most encouraging about the future of Indian Ocean studies is the recent and growing emergence of, a, of new centers of scholarly activity and venues for the exchange of ideas. All of these reflect the initiatives of an individual scholars and their ability to raise funds from within their universities and extramural funding agencies. Currently, the best established academic centers are the, Indi uh, the IOWC at McGill, and the Aegis Collaborative Research Group Africa in the Indian Ocean Network at Ross Shield University, Denmark. Under the energetic leadership of Gwyn Campbell and Preben Karlsholm, respectively, one hopes that these centers will continue to flourish institutionally beyond the tenures of their directors. Among its activities, the IOWC has since 2017 published the Journal of Indian Ocean World Studies. In the case of the five-year project on Connectivity in Motion, Port Cities of the Indian Ocean at the Max Planck Fellow Group at Halle University, Germany, the retirement, and not like me, not totally retired, but the retirement of Burkhard Schneppel from the university has effectively ended its place as a center of Indian Ocean activity, unless Burkhardt wants to challenge this in the comments. This is regrettable, as Schneppel organized several international conferences that have resulted in important published volumes. One hopes that the newly established research center 
Indian Ocean at the German University of Technology in Oman may become an extension of that initiative. Similarly, the demise of the Zanzibar Indian Ocean Research Institute, Ziori, following the retirement of Abdul Sharif was a real loss, although there exists the possibility that the State University of Zanzibar may take up these reins. Another well-established location for Indian Ocean scholarship, albeit with a focus on Africa-Indian interactions, is the Center for Indian Studies in Africa, CISA, at the University of, Witwater, of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Disseminating information about all of these activities is made available through the Indian Ocean Studies listserv that has been moderated by Ian Walker since 2015. Sometimes overlooked in the predominant Anglophone world of Indian Ocean scholarship is the important Centre d'Histoire à l'Université de la Réunion, which includes the Centre de Recherche sur les Sociétés de l'Océan Indien and the Commission Internationale des Historiens de l'Océan Indien. CRISOI, as it's known, supports the publication of two journals that focus on the Francophone Indian Ocean, La Revue Historique de l'Océan Indien and Singi. Not to ignore a number of other Anglophone journals in the Indian Ocean region, certainly the best established scholarly journal on the Indian Ocean world in any language, however, is Etude Océan Indien, which has been published by the Institut National des Langues et Civilisations Orientales in Alco in Paris since 1982. More recent initiatives include the Leiden Center for Indian Ocean Studies and the Indian Ocean Working Group at Georgetown University, Qatar in Doha. Both sponsor regular lectures, seminars, and conferences. An exciting prospect to establish a regular platform and international organization for Indian Ocean historians was discussed energetically at the three-day Zoom conference on the Indian Ocean world, taking stock, looking ahead, that was organized this past January by historians Fahad Bishara at the University of Virginia and Ananya Chakravarti at Georgetown University. To an old hand like myself, this kind of gathering recalls the, the first Ikios conferences in the late 1970s and early 1980s in Perth. What was most encouraging to me about these well-attended Zoom sessions, however, was the fact that most of the participants represent the next generation of truly global Indian Ocean scholars. To be sure, these are not the only recent initiatives in Indian Ocean studies. While many area studies and interdisciplinary research centers that are not specifically focused on the Indian Ocean, such as the NYU Shanghai's own, global, uh, own Center for Global Asia, regularly host lectures and seminars on the Indian Ocean world, such as mine. Just this week, for example, webinars on the Black Indian Ocean, material histories of the Indian Ocean world, and Monde Insulaire de l'Océan Indien were launched, respectively, from San Francisco, George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and the École des Hautes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. As I mentioned previously, the big challenge is to secure solid institutional support for Indian Ocean studies, so that whatever the shifting interest of extramural funding agencies, there remains a sound academic base for Indian Ocean studies in the future. For example, today there is a novel and well-funded initiative on trans-regional collaboratory on the Indian Ocean, funded by the Andrew E. Mellon Foundation through the Social Science Research Council. What is primarily intended to encourage research among social scientists on the environment, rather than being aimed towards historians, it serves as a vivid index of the growing importance of the Indian Ocean region in a global context. For this, all scholars of the Indian Ocean world must be grateful. Finally, let me say something about my own trajectory as a historian of the Indian Ocean world. For as I believe you will recognize, my personal intellectual journey closely reflects the historiographic account that I have just now presented. I first studied African history as an undergraduate at Harvard and then earned my PhD at SOAS. But my fairly standard SOAS thesis topic on African trade and in my case focused on a then little studied part of Eastern Africa that pulled me out into the Indian Ocean. 
to study the ivory trade in East Central Africa necessarily made me reach beyond Africa to Gujarat. To study the slave trade likewise pulled me to the islands of the Southwest Indian Ocean, especially to Madagascar and the Mascarenes. To be perfectly honest, however, I did not really think of myself as studying the Indian Ocean. Generationally and intellectually, it was simply not in the works until the 1980s, at which time I became entangled in academic administration until the mid 1990s. So when I returned to full time teaching, I had not only to revise all my African history lectures, but also became engaged in exciting discussions in our department about developing our offerings in world history. For my part, I devised new courses on the Indian Ocean and the African diaspora. At the same time, in 1997, I was invited to present a paper on the African diaspora to a conference on the Northwest Indian Ocean as cultural corridor that was organized by the University of Stockholm. Whereas my previous research and writing had focused on the African slave trade, thinking about the diaspora opened my eyes to the wider Indian Ocean setting of my scholarship. So while I remain an Africanist, engaging with a broad sweep of Indian Ocean history continues to challenge my historian's imagination. I conclude by returning to Alan Villiers who wrote 70 years ago, quote, the Indian is a fascinating ocean, rich in history, second to none in the story of the great lands by which it is almost, but not quite embayed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ned. Uh, uh, I have joined and I thank Selena and Alice to be backups, but uh, also Brookhard uh, for introducing you. Um, uh, this is a wonderful uh, take on the state of Indian Ocean Studies, um, and uh, uh, I'm sure you are going to publish uh, uh, the article at some point because there are already questions uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, where can they find uh, the details about uh, uh, all the all the books you are mentioning. Right. Are mentioning. So, so this is a forthcoming uh, article, is it? Uh, well, it's interesting. I, I wrote it as a as an article, uh, and then I had to revise it or to present as a spoken word. Uh, so my wife, who is my long suffering uh, editor and audience, uh, listened to me read it two or three times. Uh, and Dodie McDowell, with whom I'm writing this primer on Indian Ocean history, uh, commented on the uh, written version. And he's a, he's a wonderful teacher and, and excellent editor. And so what I need to do now is to integrate, because I think the, line, the, the wording of the spoken version is better in some cases than in the written. And I took out some stuff. So I need to reintegrate that. And then, uh, you know, I, I will publish it some, somewhere. I, I'm not quite sure where, but... Uh, you know, there are lots of lots of possibilities. Could go in a world history thing, it could go in an Indian Ocean Studies place. But yeah, I want to get this. You know, I want to get this out now. Great. Uh, I think I think Gwen has this uh, journal that he brings out the Indian Ocean World Journal. Right. Yeah, that's where I think it's available thinking. online as well. Uh, so that might be helpful to various people who are attending this talk. Yeah. Uh, I, I should mention if you if you uh, in the audience have questions. Uh, you can type uh, in the Q&A box uh, down in the Zoom box, or you can raise your hand. Uh, if you want to appear on screen, I'll, I'll allow you to come and ask uh, Ned a question directly. Um, in the meantime, I see uh, there's one very, very important question here. Um, uh, Ned, uh, I think you can see it as well. Uh, could you offer suggestions for writing the history of Indian Ocean cultures for people without a written culture, right? people who do not write, uh, essentially the subaltern, I guess? References to the several uh, at, at the very bottom, uh, at the, it's by uh, Saina Shegel. Oh, right, yeah, I see. Um, it's uh, let's say the history of the last cars, for yeah. example. Somebody is writing that, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I think I think it definitely is uh, possible. Clearly, it depends. Uh, something like that is going to depend on field work sort of, you know, whether you call it anthropological, ethnographic, or a historian working in the field doesn't really make any difference to me, since, uh, uh, you know, all of us uh, get kind of, we cross train ourselves in these ways. 
Uh, I think obviously oral, uh, oral histories are important and they of course present their own set of uh, challenges methodologically in terms of you know, what, is, what is myth, what is history, what does it mean to people uh, as opposed to what do you as a scholar think it actually took place. Uh, then the, the uh, and related to that is there often uh, in such societies, somebody has collected folk tales uh, or uh, poetry, other forms of literature. Um, and then finally, there's, there's uh, the possibility that depending on where you are, that there may be uh, archeological evidence uh, or, or uh, object history, since this is, there was a wonderful um, first webinar just, that, just two days ago that um, Nancy Um kicked off. Uh, on material objects. So I think it's, it's possible. Uh, I think the, the ta time depth of a study like that will range from the mythic past, which could be incredibly ancient, but who would know without the archeological evidence to fairly contemporary, but untangling the, let's say the period from the late 19th century to the present should not be impossible uh, for a non-literate society. So. I, you know, I encourage you to do what you're trying to think, trying to do there. And, uh, uh, and uh, I should also say that non, that evidence from literary sources, uh, which are often from produced, are recorded clearly by people who are literate, but about the, the traditions and songs and poetry of uh, their non-literate fellows, uh, citizens, if you want to call them that, inhabitants of an area, uh, can also be very valuable to a historian who's using mainly published accounts or archival accounts, uh, certainly for getting a sense of what people thought. Uh, I found that when writing the, my short uh, history of the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean and World History, that those sources were incredibly valuable for sort of getting the voices of people heard. Bukhad, I see your hand raised. You have a question. You're on the screen already. Yes, if I may. Thanks again, uh, Ned, for this fascinating talk, but I must admit that this was also a frustrating talk. I have, your, I have the privilege to have all your bibliographical references, and I see that I have to continue reading for the next 20 years in order <laughs> to, read, to read all these important works. And uh, this brings me to uh, younger students. I'm getting retired, so I will find the time to read this. But uh, those who have to write a PhD or whatever, uh, they may ask themselves, how can I do Indian Ocean Studies? Especially from my discipline, uh, social anthropology, we have the motto, La small places, large issues. So. We send our students to small places. They have to study small places and in small places and get malaria and all that. And then they come back and have maybe understood their small place. But when they do Indian Ocean studies, they do not only have to consider large issues. What is my contribution to a large issue like, for example, globalization. But I'm also demanding from them that they get an idea about the history, the whole history, the long history of the Indian Ocean and of other places in the Indian Ocean world as well. So at one point, if they ever want to finish a doctoral thesis, then they have to cope with this. And the solution can only be a methodological one. This links up to the question, the first question. It's not just a question, do we also include oral history and literal history, but it's a methodological question how can you study a small place, or if you wish as a historian, a short period in history, and yet mm -hmm. be aware of and contribute something to the large ocean, to large issues, or to the long durée history? What can you recommend students as you are working on a primer? How can you not frustrate students, but uh, encourage them and incite them to uh, tackle these various also interdisciplinary challenges. 
So that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, well, one, it's, in, it's interesting. One of the, uh, as we all know, when you're studying as a graduate student and you're, and you're in both the, pre the preparation to undertaking your own research involves diving deep into the literature of often methodological of your particular discipline. This would be especially true in, in the social sciences and, and anthropology where you know you simply have to do certain kinds of things. Uh, and or, or in history, if when you're studying a specific thing, mastering the historiography of that particular issue. Uh, the other thing that affects graduate students uh, at that at that moment is uh, trying to cope with the general theoretical trends, things that are trendy at the moment. Uh, so at one point in, in, uh, in the study of uh, African history, uh, mode of production theory was very big, uh, came and went. Uh, globalization as a theoretical concept is, has come and I'm not sure it's, it's gone yet, but, it, but you know, so, one of the things I found as a, as a teacher of graduate students was that I often could avoid reading a lot of junk that my graduate students had been forced to read. I got that they would fill it up to me and I, I would sort of, you know, uh, so, but I think that, so that, that's just a quirky thing. But I think that this, the basic answer, Burkhart, is that uh, it's easier now to, to at least to get a handle on the complexity of the Indian Ocean material, because there is so much available to read. You can, you know, you don't have to do everything in a in a first study, but it seems that there's there's enough solid material that you can, you know, draw upon certain general studies of the Indian Ocean world to to and perhaps global world to sort of, to situate your own work. In general, however, to be able to sort of do the kind of thing, you know, I've been doing this for 55 years or so. It's a long time, uh, 60 years, whatever. Uh, so I think that one of the advantages is that humanists, social scientists, historians, whatever you, Unlike uh, what is thought about mathematicians, you know that they kind of they've every original thought they've had is gone by the time they're 28 or something like that. I think that over a lifetime of scholarship and thinking and and reading, you you develop you de you know you're able to expand out. So, for example, I find myself reading as much about uh, Indonesia and. India and God, you know, everywhere in the Indian Ocean world, the Middle East, as I do about Africa. In fact, I actually read less stuff about Africa than I used to because I'm not teaching at the moment. So I don't have to teach, you know, a general survey of African history right now. I try to stay in touch with things. You can only do so much. Uh, and I must say, uh, however daunting the bibliography to a paper like this may be, every time I you know, start looking at something else, I think, oh my God, I haven't seen that, or, you know, I missed that, you know, it's, con it's constant. Uh, and uh, of course that gives an opening for graduate students and everybody else to come in and say, you missed this. But I think that's just, that just par for the course. Uh, so I do think that, that uh, there has to be a balance, especially given the 19th century structure of, PhD dissertations, theses, that there has to be a balance between doing what you're supposed to do or what we've been doing for decades and expanding out, which is why, of course, dissertations very rarely become first books without, oh, five to seven years of revision. I mean, some people are able to do this right away or to write uh, a dissertation that, that is publishable, publishable as a book. But for the most part, they're different. They're they're different animals, uh, and uh, so I think that what happens is that people sometimes go back after they've filed their thesis. 
they'll go back and do some more basic research, something they know they missed. You know, I didn't get to this, these files, or I need to go back into the field to, to follow up. But most of the work that people do to make their, to transform a dissertation into a book is they read. They read broadly and they teach. That's the other thing. They teach and then they, then they can generalize. You know, you get rid of a lot of the chunky stuff, the clunky stuff that, you're, that you had to do. You have a different introduction and you kind of let it flow a little differently. So, so that, that's a yeah. an answer to a complicated question. One, one of uh, those uh, person you, you are thinking about, perhaps uh, Ned, uh, who did his book fairly quickly from dissertation is Fahad, of course. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Fahad uh, is, is trying to start a war between Indian Ocean Studies and Atlantic Ocean Studies. So I'll, I'll let him ask his question to you directly. Uh, Fahad, do you want to show up and ask the question? Sure, am I here? Yeah, you're okay. here. I feel like I'm here. I'm here. I can right. see your I can see your dows, not your face. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm I, I don't have access to like uh, the the video settings on this, so I don't really okay. know how to how to do it in this. Well, anyway, dows dows in in Zanzibar are are better than my face anyway. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I, one of the things that I've been I've been sort of thinking about, and maybe this is just because of where I am in Virginia, um, but um, the you know in the in the American Academy it seems like the the conversation on Atlantic history has really taken off and matured in many ways and we have lots of terrific work and lots of deep thinking about the Atlantic and it's become a site for thinking about all sorts of uh, of interesting sort of uh, historiographical issues and it's become very very much sort of celebrated in the American Academy uh, by contrast the literature on the Indian Ocean the historiography of the Indian Ocean I, I mean you've you've uh, one thing that one of the things I really appreciated about your talk is that you actually were able to chart quite a bit of development that it's it's very hard to see when you're like in it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but um, it it I can't help but feel often that that we're somehow lagging behind Atlanticists uh, in in terms of uh, the the sorts of conversations that we're having, the debates on the field that we're having, and the implications. Um, the stakes involved in doing the kinds of work that we're doing, uh, but then also in terms of it just just in terms of a presence really in in the academy, it seems like we're we're not quite there. And I, uh, I and you know I ask in the question box like what gives like what's 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 going on here like how and what do we need to do to 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 get our field there? And I ask this of, of you because you've been in these conversations for a very yeah. long time and you've no doubt seen the 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 sort of the rise and transformation of Atlantic history alongside everything else. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting. You know, I, I uh, some years ago, in I guess one of the first things I did on the African diaspora in the Indian Ocean, I talked about the the tyranny of the Atlantic, which Richard Allen picked up and you know used in about three or four <laughs> different articles that he's written, uh, and it's true. That that and and the, the, you know the, the, when I when I the opening to my talk uh, uh, about the AHR forum uh, when I sent that the first draft of that my paper to Dodie McDowell <laughs> Dodie made a comment he said the historiographical gift that keeps on giving you know <laughs> because it, it's still true uh, I think but it's you know in some ways it's not. You compare it to uh, the imbalance in in European in let's say the notion of Western Civ between national histories of France and Germany and England as opposed to Eastern Europe, uh, where you know it's for a long time. Obviously, people in Eastern Europe were writing these things, but in terms of how they were viewed. Uh, from let's say a North American perspective, they were quite different. I don't know. I think I think in in uh, uh, there are there are certainly things to be learned from this, and and there are also connections to be made, which is one way of doing this. Uh, uh, Richard Allen uh, and and Pierre Larson uh, have certain in terms of the slave trade uh, have uh, have made a point of this connection. And one of the things, in fact, I've got a chapter on the Indian Ocean uh, 
coming out in Portuguese in a, in a book that's going to be published in about three weeks uh, uh, at Campinas at, at, uh, in Brazil that uh, Rocanaldo Ferreira and Lucy, Lucy Len Reginaldo uh, organized a conference a couple of years ago. Uh, and there, in, there are people in Brazil working on Mozambique and, and, and you know, Indian Ocean things. And there are people uh, uh, in Portugal who are making this connection. So, to, so there, there, you know, there are certain things like that. But in general, I think it's unlikely, given the geopolitics of the, of the United States and the trajectory of our, the, the history that we have of being an Atlantic nation and being a Euro, a Euro American nation, uh, I think it's unlikely that the Indian Ocean is ever to be quite uh, as, uh, you know, as centrally located uh, as as the Atlantic. Uh, for one thing, nothing. If you, you know, we include China, very much so. It's, I do. It's part of the Indian Ocean world, but. Uh, the Indian Ocean world itself uh, doesn't represent a kind of existential threat the way apparently China does the United States. Uh, and so, uh, it, you know, it's kind of interesting that, that Pacific studies also, I mean, there's a fascinating literature, but of course there are not as many, you know, not as many people, at least in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Of the Pacific Ocean, Pacific studies are also not as not as central to the United States. So the Atlantic really has dominated this in a way uh, that reflects the history of the United States. So I think that we just have to, you know, people just have to keep on pushing. There are these these all of these webinars that are appearing. I mean, you know, the the pandemic has forced people to come up with interesting ways to make connections. Uh, and uh, although I think everybody is getting a little sick sometimes, you know, when you have five webinars or six webinars in a week or something, this one that I mentioned in Paris, uh, being on the West Coast is not very good. The one in Paris is, uh, takes place at 11 a.m. in the morning. Well, that's, uh, you know, the middle of the night for me. So I'm not going to get up at 3 a.m. to get to, to, to to attend a webinar about something I really care a lot about. So I sent them an email. I said, you know, next time, maybe you could have it later in the afternoon so people in, in North America could, could attend. Uh, yeah. But anyway, anyway, I think, I think that the question's a really important one. And I, I hope that, I think one of the things that can help here is that people working on the Indian Ocean can, can uh, learn something in terms of what's what's going on in the Atlantic world, not necessarily in its specifics, but in the the both methodological and and in terms of perspective as to what they might uh, how they might apply it to the Indian Ocean world. But again, it's a very different place. It's a different place altogether. Ned, before I come to uh, Edita and and Richard Allen, uh, there's another question related to possible threat to the field. Uh, which is about the institut institutionalization of Indian Ocean Studies. As, as you pointed out, there are a number of institutes that are coming up. Uh, uh, and the question is, uh, is that a threat uh, to the future of the field uh, that these institutions might be dictating the scholarship? Uh, and I would suggest something similar may be happening in, in, in China with regard to this concept of maritime Silk Road and its implications on Indian Ocean Studies. Well, um, it, the, it shouldn't. I mean, China may be a different kettle of fish here. I don't know, you know. Um, but if you look at the, if you look at area studies, the history of area studies, there's a, you know, there's lots of crit critiques that have been made of area studies in terms of their, the way in which they followed the Department of De <laughs> Defense uh, division of the world and things like that, and and, and that prevented a cross a cross disciplinary work. Uh, Fahad's a, a good example. I tried to recruit Fahad to UCLA, but it was hard to he didn't we didn't ha it was hard to fit him into a field initially. Uh, we it actually we the department has changed that, so it has some of its admissions are for people who are not in a specific field. 
So, so uh, but in terms of the actual work that individuals did, uh, unless you have a very dictatorial, tight-fisted director, uh, I don't think it makes much difference. Uh, now, it can in the sense, and this is different from the American system, I, you know, I see these like PhD program to study X, Y, and Z and there are five dissertations. Uh, and yes, that could, that could direct research. Uh, and that's, that's a, I think that's more of a European kind of a, a model than exists in North America. But, um, but it doesn't worry, what worries me more is that there's never any, there are never any places, you know, that, that, that uh, pe people once asked me, why did we not do something like this at UCLA? after we had this big, uh, it was like Ikeos in 2002. Uh, and, you know, I was just coming out of administration and I didn't want to go back in and all. I ended up being chair of my department again. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it takes a special ambition and drive to want to, to do this. And so the, the combination of individuals and institutions are very important, it seems to me, for keeping certain places and certain activities uh, possible. Thank you, Ned. Uh, uh, Edita is, is on the screen and, and she has a question that relates to Southeast Asia, I, I presume. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nansen, and thank you, Professor Alpes and to Burkhardt uh, for uh, this wonderful seminar. Actually, I should probably say that Burkhardt was my uh, supervisor, thesis supervisor 10 years ago, so I hope I grew a bit <laughs> through this period, <laughs> intellectually, not only uh, literally. Uh, but the question is, um, I myself work on the South China Sea and um, I'm uh, doing field research on small island and actually I treat them as a kind of nodal point where the uh, et different ethnic group across each other and basically they could be like this nodal point which connects um, wider region and uh, cannot be represented only in the nation state boundaries. My question is how do you place the South China Sea which itself could be a zone of connections and the unit of analysis sometimes also known as a Malay, uh, the Malay world uh, in the history of the Indian uh, Ocean and uh, that the Malay world in a way comes to Madagascar. Uh, so how, what is the, the place uh, of the South China Sea um, in your thinking uh, and in your contextualization of the Indian Ocean? Okay, I'm, I'm hoping I got your question because the sound was not very, was not mm -hmm. very clear. I was kind of, uh, the combination of that plus my hearing. <laughs> So the, the let me see. So the question is, what what is my sense of the place of the South China Sea in the? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, as I said, you know what what was? Let me back up a bit. What what was interesting when I started teaching this course on the Indi on the Indi Indian Ocean, which and I have I taught it about five times or six times from the time I came. I think I first taught it in two thousand one or something, and I retired from teaching in 2013. So sometimes I would teach it every other year and it became my lecture notes and my PowerPoints became the sort of the, you know, the rough foundation for the book that, that I published. And for me, what was interesting is, you know, having to figure out what I, what was the Indian Ocean? Like, you know, was the Red Sea part of the Indian Ocean? Was the Cape part of the Indian Ocean? was, were the Philippines. I mean, the Philippines, yes and no, you know, they're sort of in an odd, odd position. But, but as soon as I started reading about Southeast Asia, insular Southeast Asia in particular, I mean, although I also the whole Vietnamese coast and all of the earlier uh, peninsular stuff as well. And it became very clear to me that it was, um, you know, quite apart from the, the Ming treasure voyages and all of that stuff uh, that I knew about from, from East Africa, that the South China Sea was a critical part of the Indian Ocean world. Uh, uh, and that, uh, and it opened up, oh, you know, it opened up a way of seeing the whole area. Uh, and th that I just hadn't, you know, I 
really hadn't thought of before, obviously. Uh, and, you know, I don't read one of, one of the, the thing about language is I'm very, very uh, specific about this. So I mentioned that Charles Boxer was one of my, except he was my University of London examiner, my external examiner. And Boxer was an incredible uh, polyglot. Uh, uh, I visited, I once visited his home to sort of have him hand me a bunch of original documents he had in his, in his uh, file. But I remember walking in and there was, you know, a whole book, a whole wall of books in, in Japanese and Chinese because he, he's, you know, he'd been an intelligence officer in Southeast Asia, knew these things, but he didn't know any Indian languages and he didn't know any African languages. And, uh, and nobody can do that. I mean, it's not, you know, I think one of the things that is happily avoided here is the old Orientalist thing about, you know, go away and learn 16 languages and then come back and talk to me. Uh, it forces you to, to when, you, when you can't find something in a language you can read, you, it should normally be English or French or possibly Portuguese or something or German. And you go to, you know, you go to this network of people who do read these languages, you said, can, and, and I'll give you a, a, a good example of this, which has nothing to do with the South China Sea, but is a, to the point, I think. I'm writing a paper for a conference in Zanzibar later this year uh, on cloves and vanilla, the change in the 19th century. First, how, you know, the whole story about how cloves got out of the Moluccas to Reunion and then to Zanzibar. But also it turns out, I've just, <laughs> nobody's written, that vanilla was basically, they broke the monopoly from vanilla, which is in uh, uh, Mexico, and brought it to Reunion and, and how that spread. So in studying this thing about the clothes, I ran across a couple of sources that give words for implements, agricultural implements in Swahili, but they're, but they're not standard Swahili. So I sent out an email to people I know who are expert, who are Swahili experts. And I've got a string of emails over the last, from over a four day period that are just extraordinary and, and have enabled me to completely rewrite a couple of sentences into a paragraph in that book. And that's what, I mean, I think that's what's involved here. As far as, the, you know, so, but in terms of the centrality of the Indian Ocean, of the uh, South China Sea, I think that since so much of the scholarship initially focused on the Western Indian Ocean, uh, you know, nobody said, you know, is the Gulf very important? It was actually kind of interesting. I mean, from an African perspective, it's only recently that the Red Sea has really emerged. Even as, as a central part of the Indian Ocean. Bay of Bengal, I mean, there certainly was good stuff written about that, but not in the way that it is, has now sort of entered. And I think the South China Sea, if you look at the entire Indian Ocean, you just can't ignore it. It's absolutely a fundamental part, uh, a part of this. Now, whether it all belongs to China is another question altogether. <laughs> but, but in terms of, of uh, uh, and whether you know, and whether or not everything that Ibn Battuta and a whole lot of other people ever wrote, uh, or whether you know, as Africanists, you could jump on Kunlun to say, ah, it must mean Africans, whether that's true or not. I mean, these are all big, big issues of evidence and and methodology and 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 language knowledge. Uh, and I think one of the things that's exciting about the whole area. Uh, and I presume this is true of Chinese sources as well as uh, Indonesian or Southeast Asian sources, that there, there are probably still a lot of things to be discovered or at least to be exploited uh, by uh, China scholars with an interest in the Indian Ocean that, that haven't, been, haven't been found. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think uh, the underwater archeology span aspect is really developing uh, these days in South China Sea. And that oh might reveal new things. Um, the texts are there, I, I think people know, but the archeology span that you also mentioned, and especially underwater archeology span is, 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 is revealing new things and we'll see new aspects emerging from that. Right, and that's, that's something that was spoken about in the materials. Uh, yeah. uh, we, since Ned, we are running out of time, we'll have two yeah. final questions, one by Richard Allen, 
Uh, and the final question is, uh, is about your favorite book on Omani slavery in Zanzibar and why we'll come back to that as the ending question since you are doing a paper for Zanzibar. So I'll let uh, Richard ask uh, uh, his question. Uh, Ned, first of all, I have to thank you, right, for coining that marvelous phrase, the tyranny of the Atlantic. <laughs> uh, I, I'm indebted to you, sir, and I owe you a, a, a good glass of wine or a good beer. Um, you made an elo eloquent case, right, for uh, the development of uh, uh, the notion of Indian Ocean studies in an Indian Ocean world. Um, but what would be your thoughts about the limitations of the concept of an Indian Ocean world to our understanding of global history? And you touched on this briefly because when I did my book on European slave trading, right? One of the things that I wanted to emphasize that we had to look at that as a, in, in a truly global context. So, I mean, with all of these other fascinating topics that have been coming up, I just, I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the sort of the larger viability of the concept of the world, of the oceanic world, to our understanding of global history. Uh, no, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's, it sort of is, is a question about, do you think of the Indian Ocean world as IOW with all caps or I with a small w? Uh, and you know, and that's <laughs> it, one is never quite sure. I think uh, no. I think the the uh, the the larger global connections are clearly Im important, uh, and they're important from if you're looking at ancient history, where uh, you know connections to the to the Mediterranean world were or significant, or you're looking at contemporary history. It's interesting that you, you point this out, that both Jeremy Prestholt's book and uh, Matt Hopper's books both make a clear point about, about the, as it turns out, the American connection, which was uh, very powerful, uh, without necessarily having to think about it as being, uh, you know, to get back to Fahad's point, the Atlantic world. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think that one of the things I had not ever done myself is I taught a course on world history. And, I'm, and I uh, sort of like Sanjay in this sense, I don't think of myself as a world historian particularly because uh, there's a whole body of literature there. So things like, uh, that's, why the, that's why I'm skeptical about world systems analysis in general. So I think that, yeah, like the trap that area studies presented uh, and that everybody has been subsequently working to be in and out and you know kind of tease apart yeah indian ocean the notion of the indian ocean world if it becomes uh, too exclusively a hermetically sealed unit has got real problems uh so i think that uh the fluidity and movement that has always characterized its history is a good way to think about how to how to conceptualize the Indian Ocean world, not as something. So you you do have to put you know for the sake of scholarship for teaching you have to box things in some ways because the, the last thing a student in particular wants to hear when they come to ask you something is well that's a very complicated issue. <laughs> they want to you know people want. If they don't want specific answers, they want to know what the con so I think it's hard to avoid that uh, that problem, but I think we can avoid the trap, uh, and that's that's how I would think about it. Great. Uh, so so Ned, the final question yeah. is about your favorite book on Omani slavery in Zanzibar, uh, and why? Do you have a favorite book on Omani slavery? <laughs> No, oh, you know, God. Well, I guess Fred's book, uh, Fred Cooper's book. But you know, this one of the th uh, this just again to show you how the Indian Ocean works. There's there's a wonderful young scholar. I guess she's Dutch, uh, named Dorit Brixius, who's written some amazing stuff, some articles about the movement of uh, scientific knowledge and plants from Southeast Asia to Mauritius. Uh, and I've been using, really, going through her stuff to use it to look at 
how cloves were established on Zanzibar because the one, although there's lots of information about slavery and Fred's book really is, is wonderful in that way. Um, it's not at all clear how the actual planting took place, how the original planting, because there isn't any evidence. Uh, so there's a, there's a case that, of the earlier question, of what do you do when there's, no, when there's no evidence? You go and you read other people who've made suggestions and you suggest possibilities. Maybe somebody will find something. So I guess, I guess Fred's book is still, and it's a trick to Fred, who is an extraordinary scholar. That his book on plantation slavery is, is probably the, you know, the, the key book for, for Zanzibar itself, for Omani slavery. But there's a whole bunch of other, I mean, there's some wonderful stuff that's been done. Thank you, Ned. Uh, I, I would like to thank you for this wonderful talk, and, and I look forward to uh, have the, the article in, in print. Uh, the bibliography will be really, really good for those of us who are trying to help uh, students learn about Indian Ocean. Uh, and and it's, thank you for getting up so early uh, in, in the West Coast for, for this, and then also doing the practice run. And also to Brukhad, uh, who has been an, an old friend of mine for, for a long time now, uh, and, and the three of us were in, in Berlin uh, for the conference uh, on, on animals and cargoes. Uh, so it's wonderful to see both of you. And thank you, Brukhad, for introducing uh, Ned uh, for us uh, and to Selena and to Alice being backups uh, because I had another conference webinar to attend. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, to see all of you in person uh, at, at some point. And, and also the audience, uh, thank you for joining us from all over the world. Uh, this is uh, the way in which we can see you. Nice to see you, editor. Uh, also appearing uh, on, on the screen. So thank you for, for, to Ned for bringing all of us together uh, and, and to Brookhart for co-sponsoring or co-organizing this event. And thank you for inviting me to give this talk because it's one of those things that I, I was clearly, I was, I suppose I was waiting to do something like this. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you and, and have a nice day, Ned. Uh, have a nice thank day, you. Brookhart. Uh, and uh, good evening and good morning to all of you. Enjoy your rest of the day. Bye-bye. Very good. Bye -bye. Thank you, Tony Tenzin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.